Welcome to today's program on language in the courts and a special welcome where we have Berkeley Judicial Institute faculty here, a wonderful group of people. But for those who don't know Berkeley Judicial Institute, please forgive a quick and I hope painless advertisement before we get started. Now that we have you here, we'd love to have you back. Consider uh, checking out our website where you'll see registrations for future programs, recordings of past programs. You can join our mailing list, follow us on Twitter. Painless, right? That's it. On to the main event. Today's program was first offered to the Federal Magistrate Judges Association earlier this year to rave reviews. And one of Berkeley Judicial Institute's stellar faculty, uh, Judge Celeste Bremer, urged us to offer this program. And we're grateful to her for the recommendation and grateful, even more grateful to this faculty for agreeing to do this. You'll find faculty links in the chat, but just to set the table, Judge Ellis Sinclair serves as a magistrate judge in the Eastern District of California. Judge Mustafa Kasubi, Kasabi, I knew I'd get it wrong, forgive me, forgive me, but it's all about language. And if I get it wrong, I'm just furthering the purpose of the program. Uh, serves as a magistrate judge in the District of Oregon. So many wonderful things could be said about these two accomplished professionals, but I'll just focus on the fact that both of them have sterling Berkeley credentials. Judge Claire from the law school, uh, Judge, Judge Kasabi from the uh, undergrad. So here's what we'd like to do. The judges have uh, scheduled a back and forth that'll be about 45 minutes. During that time, if you have questions, please use the chat. At the end of that time, we'll go cameras on, hands up uh, for questions that people would like to pose. So with that, let's turn things over. Judge Claire, what will we be doing today? Thank you for that introduction, Denise. Um, Judge Kasabai and I are both delighted to be with you all to continue a conversation that we've been having with each other and with our judicial colleagues in a number of different forums this year and uh, hope to continue going forward. So I want to give you all uh, a kind of large um, big picture framework or context for the conversation that we're going to have. And I want to start by just recognizing what we all know, which is that language is the tool of our trade. That was true for us when we were lawyers. It's true for us as judges. We use language, both written and spoken, to do our work. And as judges, our words have a lot of power, literally, right? We decide things. Our words have authority and act in the world. But there are also ways that the language we choose to use apart from its direct effects has power to include or exclude people, power to recognize or erase people's identities, power to respect or disrespect. And that's power that we need to take very, very seriously. I wanna date myself <laughs> and give an example from the 1970s when I was in high school. And I made the radical proposal both in my high school's student government in which I was active and in our regional model Congress program that I participated in that we revise the version of Robert's rules of order that we used to no longer use the pronoun he as some sort of generic for person and change words such as chairman to something more neutral like chair or chairperson. And in the 1970s, proposals like that were considered the worst kind of extreme man-hating bra-burning feminism, right? Similarly, asking to be referred to as a woman instead of a girl as an adult asking to be addressed with the honorific, the title Ms, because there's no reason to refer to my marital status when I'm a professional, right? These were considered controversial asks and they're no longer controversial, right? In our courts, it is standard to use language that does not assume the only professionals are male and that uh, the word man refers to all of humanity. But once it was controversial, similarly, language about race 
the identifiers chosen by racial and ethnic minority groups to refer to themselves and the adoption of the preferred terms of those communities by the general public and by the legal establishment was originally controversial and not so in the same ways now. At least the terms that were controversial decades ago have now become the standards. And I say that just to acknowledge that language is always related to social controversy and change and that it's always changing and that it always has implications. So today, Judge Kasabai and I are gonna focus on language and gender in the 21st century, where the issues around gender are much broader than including women, right? There is a plethora of gender identities um, of the individuals who come into our courts as litigants, as attorneys, and Judge Kasabai and I share the concern I know you all have as judicial officers with ensuring that everyone who comes into our courts feels that they are being treated fairly and that includes the need for respect of diversity. But there are lots of other language issues that are hot right now and I just want to throw these out for your consideration. There are a number of folks who are asking us as judges to think about the language we use around a broad range of issues. For example, we are being encouraged by some folks to refer to incarcerated people, incarcerated persons, rather than prisoners, inmates, to refer to the unhoused, unhoused people, rather than the homeless. Disability advocates urge different language than we might be used to using for people who live with disabilities. And I want to simply suggest that we take those asks seriously. I know that already there are many of you who are thinking, whoa, 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 <laughs> to the extent that this linguistic shift or this pressure for a linguistic shift is coming from a particular advocacy viewpoint, my adoption of that requested language could be seen as bias in favor of a particular group or a particular policy position. And as judges, we need to remain neutral. And I think that's a very legitimate consideration. And it's a legitimate consideration regarding the gender issues we're going to be talking about today. But I urge you to all remember from the outset that there is no such thing as language that is completely neutral. By not using the language, um, that people ask us to use for themselves. We are also making a word choice that has meaning. So my suggestion to you all, what I wanna encourage my professional community to do is simply be more conscious about when we are making language choices that have consequences for the dignity of people who come in front of us. I have a three-part practice and it's a, it's a practice, I don't have I haven't answered these questions for myself, right? About whether to abandon use of the word prisoner and always say incarcerated person, for example. But I try first to notice when I am making a word choice in writing an order, in preparing comments I'm going to make from the bench or speaking extemporaneously. Notice when I am making a choice that is freighted with some kind of meaning about somebody else's identity and particularly if it's an identity about which they have an opinion about how they want to be seen or how they refer to themselves. So notice it. Second, ask myself, how does my use of whatever language I am choosing affect the way I think, if at all? How does the language I use affect the way that I think? It's a really interesting question. I've noticed, for example, that the convention that is very common of referring to all the parties in my written orders as plaintiffs and defendants, rather than using their name, can affect the way I'm thinking about the case and undercut an attempt to be mindful of the particular lived experiences of those parties and all the details of their lives that might be relevant to the case. So I ask how it affects me. And then I ask, how does my choice about using this word or that word or the other word affect the people to whom I'm referring and the people who are hearing or reading my order. And I just consider those issues before making my decision. They don't 
generate any particular outcome about the words. But I'm hoping that by this process of being mindful and interrogating the language I use, I will result in a more consistently respectful way of dealing with the folks who come before me. Because I want, whether I'm in my chambers or in my courtroom or in a meeting with lawyers and parties, everyone to feel respected. And that's about words. It's not just about words, right? It's about my process. It's about my body language. It's about looking defendants in the eye, criminal defendants, all parties. And we all care about that. There is a fabulous judge in New Jersey, Victoria Pratt, who has recently written a book that um, I can't wait to read. And she has a TED talk called um, Ways, that it's a, I don't remember the exact title, it's Ways That Judges Can Show Respect. I've asked the BJI staff to put links to the TED talk and the book in the chat so that you can check this out. And Judge Pratt doesn't focus on language per se, but she does talk about the importance of judicial respect for parties and how that can be conveyed. We'll focus today on the very specific issue of the words we use and now focus primarily on issues related to gender. So I'm gonna pass the baton with a question to Judge Kasavai. Judge Kasavai, and some of you may have already accessed the article that he wrote on pronouns that um, are available in the materials. Uh, Judge Kasabai, you've become a little bit of an evangelist for raising this issue of gender and language in the courts. Why does this issue matter to you? Why is it important? Uh, well, uh, funny that you use the word evangelist because what I was about ready to say at the very outset of my, my presentation was I'm not here to proselytize <laughs> or to try to convince anybody of doing something that uh, they just don't see either the need to or perhaps the validity of, but uh, to the extent that the audience here is someone who uh, are, are people who are inquisitive and curious and, and, and are looking for ways to incorporate a more expansive use of language that is respectful and dignified, then welcome. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. And the question was from Judge Claire, uh, uh, why did I get involved? Uh, why was this something that that uh, hit home to me? And I, I, I'm going to answer that, uh, but first a quote, something that inspires me with respect to this kind of work. And I think it's so important for our courts and our judges to be mindful of and why I, I want to lead off with my answer to Judge Claire. And uh, it is with this uh, quote from Audre Lorde. It is not difference which immobilizes us, but silence. And there are so many silences to be broken. I'm so grateful for the uh, uh, Berkeley Judicial Institute and, and certainly my friendship and collaboration with Judge Claire uh, over this subject to, to include this work uh, as part of the conversation. The conversation in our courts uh, and searching for ways that we can make this space more expansive and inclusive. It is my hope that by the end of the meeting today, uh, we all might be uh, a little closer to seeing how the dignified and respectful use of pronouns and honorifics in our courtrooms, in our chambers, in our legal practices really are central to access to the courts themselves and specifically to justice. I want to ground the experience of discuss my experience with and why I became even more committed to the need and interest in focusing on honorifics and pronouns in the courts around three scenarios that I'd like to share with you now. They're, they're, uh, they're originally quoted and provided in a wonderful law review article uh, from the California Law Review uh, titled Misgendering. It's uh, uh, the 109th volume page 2,227. The first scenario, a physician enters her examination room and meets a male patient for the first time. She begins to introduce herself as Dr. Brown, but the patient cuts her off and interjects. Hello, Lisa, so nice to meet you. And throughout their 15 minute checkup, the patient continues to address Dr. Brown by her first name, along with other informalities like sweetheart and honey. 
the second scenario, one that I have a bit of a personal uh, uh, connection to or relationship with by virtue of my own past experiences. An accountant's co-workers refused to pronounce uh, his name properly, Mamdu. And when he corrects them, they respond by either mockingly emphasizing his, his Middle Eastern uh, pronunciation of his name or continuing to intentionally botch it. Others are even less generous, referring to him with racist generics like Muhammad, Oba Osama, or bin Laden. Frustrated, he reports his coworkers' harassment to his supervisors, who instead of reprimanding them, suggests he adopt a nickname that is easier to pronounce. And finally, a student stays back after the first day of class to speak with her professor. As her classmates leave, the student explains she is transgender and requests that the professor refer to her using female titles and pronouns. The professor refuses to oblige. And for the remainder of the semester, the professor uses only male pronouns and titles whenever he addresses her. Now, these aren't made up instances or facts, although certainly uh, we can compile an amalgamation of experiences to describe these different experiences themselves, but they are in fact uh, facts that occurred in real cases. And what's common to each and every one of them is that by the use of certain names, the refusal to use certain names or honorifics or pronouns, the refusal to, to acknowledge a name in itself carries a great deal of power. The power to create and construct something far greater than what you had before, which is certainly, I think, the, the, the premise of what Judge Claire and I are hoping to talk about today, but also the incredible power to belittle, dehumanize, and humiliate, and also to erase. It's in this context that uh, I have been motivated to speak on this subject and to explore ways in which I might, as a judge, uh, contribute to a broader use of our language that can be more expansive. So there are three premises that that I'd like to describe uh, uh, that have described the motivation that, that I've taken up. And after Judge Claire will uh, provide uh, uh, some more uh, very helpful information, I think as uh, Judge Claire described as Gender Identity 101, uh, uh, what I'd like to do then is describe what I'm actually doing in my courtroom. The, this, the specific practices that, that I've tried to incorporate, that I am incorporating, uh, on uh, on an everyday basis uh, within my chambers. So the, here's, here are the, the, the three thoughts that I have about why this has become a personal evangelical experience for me as Judge Claire might've described, although I'm not proselytizing. First, equity, the idea of equity is that everybody ought to be able to see themselves as lawyers, judges, and righteous litigants. In my own experiences, I've seen that when we do not acknowledge someone's identity in its completeness, I think we can disenfranchise, disempower, and exclude people from those spaces. That leads into the second premise, which is I'm a judge, a public servant, and it is my duty to ensure access to our courts. My conduct, my behavior from the bench, the way in which I engage with attorneys and litigants off the bench, everything I do as a judge, the decisions that I make, either promote or restrict access to the court, to my courtroom, or to my ear when making an argument. The very basic element, the very basic fundamental point that I've found to be true is that a judge has complete, if not well, almost complete control over what happens in our courtroom, in my courtroom, on any given day. We have the authority to shape a space. I have the authority, and I would also say the obligation, the responsibility to shape a space in which people can be fully themselves as lawyers, judges, and righteous litigants. And why? 
at least the, the, the third premise. First, I'll describe it in the negative, which is, it is despairing to me to contemplate how many people have appeared in front of me over the past 15 years I've served as a judge and how many people have appeared in front of all of us or how many people that we've represented as attorneys who are fearful of how they were going to be perceived because they were either transgender, non-binary, gender fluid. I know there were cases in which I, I, I presided in, in, in state court in which defendants were set for sentencing who were also transgender. The discussion never came up. The issue was never addressed by any party or attorney. I can only imagine how fearful it would be for someone to think or perhaps know, depending on the judge in, fr in front of whom they appeared, that the sentence could be motivated by their gender identity. The silence, the not talking about it, is what dis is despairing and frightening to me. The failure to recognize one's identity, particularly when they're litigants in front of me, I think can cause a great deal of fear and stress unnecessarily. So not only is it the I think the right thing to do as one human to another, there's another valid and valuable point that I wish to pursue, which is that at the heart of it, I need to make good decisions. And in order for me to make the best decisions possible, I need lawyers and litigants to be able to present their best arguments and their best evidence. Not siding with one party or another or one attorney or another by virtue of gender identity. But when people can set aside the amount of bandwidth that they have to use and employ and allocate associated with the fear of gender identity perception and discrimination in the courtroom, I can tell you that from my own experiences as a BIPOC individual and an attorney, that there were times in which I spent more time than I cared to thinking about how the jury may look at me and, and devalue a claim for my clients. Or the same from a judge perceiving who I was. No litigant, no attorney, no party should have to spend that kind of bandwidth in my courtroom. If we can create a space as judges, and, and I know we have participants in this uh, call that also practice outside of the courtroom who aren't judges, but if we can create the spaces in which individuals who look to the courts for the resolution of disputes can do so without the perception of one's identity being used against them, I know that I can get better information and better arguments, and from that, better decisions. That makes the courts better. I think the next stage uh, after Judge Claire uh, shares more information on Gender Identity 101, I'd like to share with you some of the very specific examples of things that I've tried to do to incorporate that more expansive use and honoring. Uh, and gender identity in my, in my practice, uh, noting also that it's only a beginning of a conversation and by no means do I think I have it right. And if I have the opportunity, I'll, I'll also be able to share with you where I've screwed up. Judge Claire. Thank you. Um, so let's define some terms. Judge Kasabai has always already introduced several terms, and we know from having talked to groups of judges from all over the country 
that there are some of you all who are very familiar with this language and others to whom it may be new and or confusing. So there's a glossary in the materials. We're certainly not going to go all through it, but I just want to lay out some key concepts. The first is that I want to define the distinct categories of biological sex, gender, and sexual orientation, which are three independent variables. Every human being has all three of those things, but they are independent of each other. When we talk about biological sex, we are referring to a physiological state of being that includes internal organs, external genitalia, and chromosomes, which do not always line up in the two typical patterns, but there are two typical patterns that are related to reproductive biology. Gender is independent of the biology and has to do with one's felt sense of being a male person or a female person or other. And there are lots of other options, but it's a subjective experience and an identity. There are also cultural constructs and stereotypes and roles that are assigned according to both sex and gender. But when we talk about gender identity, we mean one sense of oneself as male, female, or other. And sexual orientation, which is independent both of one's physiology and one's gender identity, is who you want to be with, right? And so these are, these are separate variables. For example, I am uh, biologically female. When I was born, the doctor looked between my legs and said, it's a girl. And I grew up feeling myself to be female, which means that I am cisgender. This is the new vocabulary word, meaning that one's gender identity aligns in the culturally conventional way with one's biology. Um, I'm also a lesbian, right? So I'm gay, but I'm cisgender. And back in the day, back to the 1970s again, because there was such a, an ingrained cultural assumption <laughs> that gender identity reproductive biology and sexual orientation were actually all aspects of one thing, the very idea of being gay was confusing because it seemed to imply to some people that I wasn't really a woman or I didn't wanna be a woman or whoever I was with wasn't really a woman, very confusing. We now know that these are separate functions. So when we talk about the gender binary, we're referring to the model of there being only maleness and femaleness as gender options a binary system. And human development specialists now understand that that is a social construct, it is not reality. In reality, there is a spectrum of gender identities. And many people are not exclusively male or female. And when we use the term non-binary, as Judge Kasabai has already done, this is an umbrella term for people whose gender identities is neither male nor female. There are non-binary people who consider themselves to be a combination of the both or neither. Some people's gender identity is fluid, meaning it changes over time. Other people consider themselves not to have gender, to be a gender. Others consider themselves to be very much gendered, but in a way that is not typically male or female. So again, an umbrella term for folks outside of the binary. When we talk about gender expression or gender presentation, we're talking about the way that folks express their gender in how they dress, how they speak, how they act. And that is variable, right? That is variable with every gender identity category. And then we have social roles and expectations. And for those of us who fall outside the roles and expectations of the society in how we express our gender, you'll hear the term gender non-conforming, which I think is self-explanatory, right? Doesn't conform with expectations or stereotypes. But the fact that someone is gender non-conforming, for example, someone with a typically female name who appears in your courtroom with a crew cut and a man's suit, you cannot assume because of that presentation of gender what the person's gender identity is. It could be a transgender man or a butch lesbian who identifies as a woman or a non-binary person. So because these are independent variables in today's world, there can be confusion experienced 
by one's encounter, I'm gonna get personal now, as a judge, as a person, as a person who lives in a very diverse world here in Northern California, I often meet people whose gender I can't immediately identify. I'm also aware that I meet people all the time whose gender I assume I am correctly identifying because it looks typical to me, but I could be wrong <laughs> because presentation does not equal identity. And like most of you, like most human beings, when I meet someone whose gender I can't identify, it creates automatic, sometimes subliminal, maybe subtle, but real anxiety because our brains have been primed to put people in boxes, right? And when we don't know what category to put people in, there is a physiological anxiety response that we experience and that as judges, I think we have an obligation to manage so that it does not manifest itself in any way that is disrespectful of this human being that has appeared in front of us. So Judge Kasabai, to whom I'm about to hand the baton again, has referred to pronouns and honorifics. Different gender identities involve different language because our language is gendered. The personal pronouns in English, as in many but not all languages, are gender specific. So women, whether cisgender women like myself or trans women, those who've transitioned into a female identity, use she and her. And men, whether cisgender or trans, use he and him. But the non-binary folks may not use those pronouns at all. Increasingly, they use alternative pronouns, and there are a bunch of them, but the most common is the singular they, them. I know a lot of folks who use they, them pronouns. They don't all have the same gender identity as each other, but I try to make it a general practice to refer to people as they tell me they wanna be referred to, right? So they and them as a singular is accepted by the American Language Association and all the dictionaries now. This is no longer controversial. It is not a grammatical, even though it might go against the grain. Um, and these pronouns can be used in two distinct ways that I just wanna make sure you're all aware of. Individual people may choose to use they, them pronouns, either because those are pronouns that can be considered neutral or as specifically non-binary pronouns. I would say a majority of the non-binary individuals who I know personally use they, them pronouns as a reflection of their non-binary gender identity. But also they and them can be used generically by any of us as a truly gender neutral pronoun. And you probably do this even if you don't think you do. For example, at Starbucks, you might comment to your friend, oh, that drink the person has over there, right? Their drink is what I want, right? Their pastry, <laughs> that's what I want. You're saying it without any reference to the gender of the person, you might not know or care, but it just means that person. So it's a little tricky that these words can be used either in a neutral sense or to refer to a non-binary person by choice. Honorifics, the titles we use, some of them are neutral. Doctor does not specify a gender. Mr. and Ms. sure do, right? And so there is a neologism now, just as Ms. was invented, if you will, decades ago, the title or honorific mix which is spelled MX period, is a gender neutral alternative to Ms. or Mr. that some, not all, but some non-binary people choose to use. Um, so that's what we mean when we're talking about honorifics. Mix, Mr., Ms., Doctor, fill in the honorable, right? Um, so I think those are the only terms that need to be defined. If others come up that you're unfamiliar with, throw it in the chat and we'll try to help you out. So Judge Kasabai, back to you. Please tell us more about the practices that you've developed to which you've already referred. Uh, thank you. So first, uh, it's taken me quite a while to, to sort of so maybe deconstruct or unwire or sort of reprogram myself into trying to understand 
how to use uh, language and, and uh, gendered pronouns in a way that I simply haven't done for many years of my life. And so uh, my, my first observation and recommendation to everybody here who it might find themselves in, in a similar boat is to give yourself a little bit of leeway if you're working through this, this kind of practice and exploring how to incorporate um, a, a, a more expansive language than that which you've been accustomed. I am by no means an expert. I don't have all the language figured out. I'm not sure that in this space, the language is figured out and it's, it's actually constantly changing. Uh, so we can, make it, we, can have it, we can make a choice, which is, well, call me when you got it, when it, when you got it all figured out and then I'll, I'll get on board. Or we can be part of the ongoing conversation, working on what language really does work to be more inclusive in real time, in real spaces, that have an impact on, on people's dignity. And that's why I think it's important for the courts to, to lead the way. Now, the courts have a very long tradition of gendered honorifics. I mean, I, we, we, haven't been able, we, we haven't escaped it, we haven't avoided it, it's been embraced. Uh, and, and it's also within that context that, that really searching for different ways to honor identity and gender identity in that way is, is why it's more important to me in the courts than perhaps in other different in, in other spaces. So how or what did I do first? I, I was I think an unwilling or disinterested uh, uh, sideline participant in the process. I always thought of myself as somebody committed to the ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But then when I started first seeing people using their pronouns in uh, the automated email signature line, and in, in communications that I received from you know, universities, I think primarily and initially, I thought it was, uh, it took me off guard. I thought, oh, wow, uh, here are some people that are doing this and it seems like a, a worthwhile thing doing, perhaps for some people, but I couldn't see myself doing it. And I also asked the question in my, uh, uh, to myself, which is I wonder why they're actually telling me what their pronouns are, because I've always known them in this particular way. In, 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 in a gendered way. I sat with that for quite a while. I didn't see the need to pursue it. But it slowly took shape for me. And I began to understand and appreciate that affirmatively identifying one's gender, uh, gender pronouns was also a way of helping to normalize a space that was not safe for other people who didn't conform to one's uh, who was non-conforming in, in, uh, or non-binary or, or, or trans uh, gendered. In, in, and and so, uh, so the idea of making it normal began to take on greater meaning and significance to me. And yet it still took me time because I didn't think, not in my generation, I, the, the, I guess the baton had already been passed in moving these kinds of these, uh, these benchmarks. And I thought it would be best left for the newer generation to take it up and make it, uh, make it their stand. And that sat for a while too, until one day I, as, I, I, as I was considering the idea of what I can do as a judge to continue to make this space more open, it struck, the hypocrisy of it struck me. My disengagement uh, of this issue disappointed me. And I realized that what I was describing earlier to you, which is the, the value and work that we can do as judges in really moving the space into a more inclusive arena for everyone is really what I ought to be doing. Uh, and so I took it up and it was hard. The first time I, I sent out an automated signature line on an email with my pronouns, uh, uh, seemed, what well, was uncomfortable. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know how any of my colleagues or anyone else who received my emails uh, would react. Uh, but I, I was committed to trying to figure out if, how, if and how this could make a difference. And you know, there, you know, there wasn't some big splash and there wasn't some huge response and it was wonderfully anticlimactic and, and I went about my business. And it felt like I was doing something worthwhile. And yet at the same time, I continue to ask myself, is this all that judges can do? I'm still in my courtroom identifying people by the presumed gendered honorific that I had been 
working in and employing throughout the, uh, you know, throughout the course of my career. And so I searched for other ways to try to incorporate more expansive language. And my, the essay that uh, Denise uh, has provided in the written materials so, uh, walks you, you through the, the journey with all of my missteps, as well as my hope for you know, marks on some, some level of success yet to be determined. Uh, and and, and I, I, hopefully that'll be, uh, you know, it'll, it'll be a beacon of, of, hey, well, somebody else screwed up first. Um, and you don't have to be the first one. Uh, uh, somebody else tried these things first, or, and, and I'm not claiming to be the first, by the way. Somebody has tried them and written about them, and you can see them in writing, and you don't have to be that first one out wherever you might find yourself trying it for the first time, too. Uh, what I also found was important was for me to write down what my practices were, and I ended up turning it into just a two-page cheat sheet. Uh, again, I think it's also part of the materials that, that uh, uh, Denise uh, have, have, will, will have provided uh, when you registered. And it very simply outlines the specific language. And if you're a judge, you know how much we love our scripts uh, and, and the language that we need to follow so we don't mess up the language uh, in the middle of, the, of a moment of, of, of whatever we might be doing, whether uh, ruling from the bench on a civil case or sentencing somebody. Scripts are absolutely important. And when I found myself sitting down to figure out what kind of language I need to be more expansive, here's what, uh, here's what I, I discovered. There isn't that much uh, change that needs to be made in creating a more expansive uh, gendered acknowledgement from the bench. There are perhaps 10 different items that I've, I've, I've listed. And I'll just give you a, a few examples. I mean, certainly, you know, when introducing yourself, you can introduce yourself with your name and your pronouns. You can include it in the Zoom, uh, the, the Zoom thumb, uh, thumb photo, uh, whatever they're called, this, this square uh, as well. Uh, I, but what I wanted to do was figure out how to make it more, uh, more normative in the courtroom. And so I identified spaces and, uh, and practices and procedures in my court that, that it would be uh, where it, wherein I would ask people to introduce themselves or I would be uh, discussing a matter with, with attorneys or, or, or parties. And so this, uh, this cheat sheet of sorts describes just a few and uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of these examples. For example, in Rule 16 and schedule conferences or in oral arguments, I will in every case uh, say something to the effect of, thank you for being available to discuss whatever the subject matter is today. I like counsel to please introduce yourselves and, and including giving me your full name and your honorific, such as Miss, Mix, or Mr. So I can address you respectfully throughout our meeting today. And in criminal dockets, I'll ask uh, 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 an attorney after introducing themselves, if they're going to be introducing a client, to please also give me their honorific so I can address them respectfully throughout the course of the hearing. And I, I will give the example, such as Miss Mix or Mister. Now, I, if there's anything uh, novel about the language that I'm using in, in these two particular examples, is that I provide a very narrow range of the examples of that which can be used. And the only thing that I add in, a, uh, in addition to that, which has been normally used throughout all of our time on the, the bench in, in, in the, into the past, but not so much of the past because Ms. wasn't recognized for, for quite a while before, is also the, the honorific mix. So people get clued into the notion that I'm inviting, not forcing, but inviting people to, to identify their honorific. And when they give me their honorific, I make a note of it and ensure that I do not misgender somebody and use the honorific that they've given me. Uh, the other practices are, are also self-explanatory. I include the, the same kind of language when, uh, when giving instructions in my case management orders and my trial management orders. I'll also walk attorneys through prior to a trial to, to let them know that, that I am going to ask them in advance. That means that in that moment that when they end up introducing witnesses or their clients to the jury uh, or calling them to please make sure that you're including their honorific. That way I can address anybody by the honorific that's been identified and it clues the attorneys into knowing that they, they should confirm the accuracy of the honorifics that they're using. 
Uh, finally, I've included my own pronouns in the website materials on the District Court of Oregon website. And I include my pronouns in the byline of my opinions, uh, whether they're published or not. And, uh, and that effort and focus is to try to simply normalize the use of pronouns uh, such that it does not become unsafe or unusual or awkward for anybody else, maybe down the road, who might do the same. Now, you might ask, why go to so much effort to change all of this language? How about just simply going gender neutral? And maybe there are, there's one word that can describe all of us, counselor, attorney, or perhaps refer to people as plaintiff and defendant or litigant. And uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the conversation needs to continue to happen. And uh, you know, I encourage that that be part of the conversation as we move forward. But I, 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 don't, I, I don't think I'm an agent to move in that direction. And, and I'll tell you why. First, as, as a cisgender man, I think there's a level of privilege that I, I enjoy. And, and to argue from this position that, hey, by the, by the time I'm important enough to be a judge in service here, let's not use, pron let's not use gendered pronouns. Uh, I think that that is an opportunity and, and, and we run the risk of, of erasing other people's identities in a way that has been important for people throughout time. I'd also offer this. It, it's, it, it's a bit presumptuous of me to suggest moving forward with gender uh, neutral uh, honorifics or pronouns at a time when I think this conversation is just beginning. People have been struggling to be seen, to have their identities identified. People are discriminated and harmed because of their identities and their gender identities. I think until we reach the point of respect and, and a dignified perception of people that do not conform to cisgendered identities, the conversation needs to embrace this diversity. I'll also offer it by, uh, another, uh, by way of another example. Uh, there was a time here in Oregon uh, where I was uh, uh, going to a Saturday market and I saw this really cool t-shirt stand and I walked up to it and I saw this shirt called Love See No Color. It was a beautiful looking shirt, you know, rainbowed and, and it said Love See No Color. And on, on one level, what a great idea. But on another level, as a person of color, to not see me or to see the necessary challenges or the implicit biases that affect my everyday life can't be the kind of love I'm interested in. So love see no color is a, is, is a comment that can be made from a place of, of privilege, from a place of maybe also, uh, you know, I, 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 I get it, it's a messy idea. Let's just, let's just set it aside and, and not talk about it. That oftentimes, becomes the default when we talk about going neutral or seeing no color. And I get that there is some transcendent space somewhere in the future we might get to where that can be accomplished. But until then, I think we have to embrace it. And for that reason, and struggling with figuring out how to use language in our courts that expand the acknowledgement of, of the, the inherent equality of every human being through our language is so important to me as a judge. Now I've also screwed up. Uh, I'll give one example and then I think we should maybe then open it up to, uh, up to uh, questions and comments and, and, and brainstorming. And, and, and that is, I, I, I've always wanted to be careful about forcing any of this on anybody. And so I, I, I'd also offer that, you know, there used to be a practice uh, very early on where, where, and I think I've seen this in law schools where, where students would, would walk, you know, sit around in a room while they're introducing themselves, offer their pronouns and ask other people what their pronouns are. And, and, and that could be a pretty unsafe place to, to be. And, and, I, and I would encourage anybody from the bench not to ask people for their pronouns, invite people to introduce themselves with their honorific, but to force it when they don't uh, can be, a, can be um, can be potentially damaging and unsafe for somebody. I'll, and I'll give you an example of something that, that came, to, came to my experience 
uh, earlier on in, in, in my practices. And that was, I was holding a Rule 16 conference by telephone and I was asking everyone to please introduce themselves in the same way that I've used this language. And I, I went around and, and one of the attorneys who was from out of state, uh, when, when he was uh, going to introduce himself, uh, didn't offer uh, anything, just, just, just his name. And in that moment, I, I said, well, you know, the, or, 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 let me clarify. He, he, he said something to the effect of, I'm not sure what you're talking about with respect to pronouns. I don't understand what you're saying. And, it, and I thought I just simply didn't clarify it. I didn't say it clearly enough. And so I, I, I explained, well, I'm, I'm, I'm asking for people to please kindly introduce themselves so I can address them respectfully throughout the course of this hearing, since we're not here together in person. And I want to make sure that we have you know, a, a way to, to, to address each other respectfully. That's my practice. In my chambers and a pause and he then said again i have no idea what you're talking about your honor I, this this isn't something i understand and at that point i thought well maybe there was some resistance but i try one more time because it's not often it's not uncommon for me to be rambling and unclear and so i thought i'll try it one more time and i did after which he he, he said your honor i'm not interested just go ahead and assume and in that moment i, I took a deep breath and I reflected on what, the whole point of what I was trying to do, which was create a space in which people were safe and expansive. But there are also, I think, places in which people just don't want to engage in this way for a variety of reasons. My initial assumption was is that because he was uh, that, that he objected to the practice by virtue of perhaps being homophobic in some way. But that was a, that was also an unfair assumption. I checked it at the door and I also realized it could have also just been as easily that this is on the record for somebody from another state uh, and potentially in, in another space in which it's not safe to identify in any other way. It's not for me to create that safe, uh, that unsafe space. And so I went ahead and assumed. So the times in which I've, uh, I've, I've, I've uh, 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 I, I confronted sort of the silence around this issue, I'll go ahead and assume because it's not my place, especially with the, as a judge with some level of authority and power, I don't want that to be perceived as coercive uh, or, or, or forceful. So about two years into this practice, uh, what have I found? First, my colleagues have been incredibly supportive. So if, you think, if you're thinking that you might get pushback from your colleagues as judges, uh, now, I, I can't claim it won't happen, but I can tell you that here in Oregon with my other 14 or 15 college uh, colleagues on the district court bench, uh, there ha have been others who have incorporated their use of pronouns uh, in, in, their, in, in their websites, in their signature lines. Uh, uh, and and that's, that's been encouraging to see that in, their, in, in everyone's own way, I think we find our own journey towards creating that safe space that we are finding capable, being capable of. of um, of shaping. Uh, attorneys are incredibly adaptive and willing, and I recognize that uh, one can certainly argue that perhaps I have a bully pulpit, but if I carry myself in a way that encourages and supports the practice without forcing it, I found that attorneys have, have been able to come on board and understand what it is that I'm attempting to do. The U.S. Attorney's Office, for example, have, has commented uh, through you know, their their chief uh, their chief uh, criminal uh, head that they they've noticed it and we've adapted and uh, we welcome it. And and so there's there's been quite a bit of, of willingness to to uh, to enter into the space and and to acknowledge it. Attorneys who are introducing their clients and and who have also appeared in front of me uh, times before. While they were unsure of what was happening the first time I ever asked, uh, now are, are, are prepared and, and everything continues to move smoothly. I've had also attorneys when asked to introduce themselves such as Miss Mix, Mr. or Mix uh, have introduced themselves as Mrs. And so we, we created, I think an expansive place in which uh, to the extent that gender identity is still a very important part of who we are, uh, creating safe spaces for everybody to be honored in the way that they wanna be honored in a respectful and dignified way. Finally, I'll make this comment. By forcing myself to be more intentional and frankly, quite a bit out of my own comfort zone when it comes to the use of language in this way, 
I think I've developed a bit more awareness of checking some of my implicit biases elsewhere. And yes, it takes bandwidth. <laughs> and yes, it can be a little bit more exhausting. But I was just talking about how people who appear in front of me have expended so much bandwidth trying to stay safe. It's the least that I can do. And the disruption of the conventional use of words does lead, I've, I've observed, into a stumbling into a greater awareness, I think for judges, of the things that we do or the things that we don't say have as impacts on the parties in front of us. Attention is the beginning of devotion. My devotion is access to justice and our courts. The attention, sometimes the painful intentionality of the work that we're doing in, in making this more expansive place open for everyone, I think it helps us, helps me achieve a, a sense of, of increased access to the courts that I don't think would happen if I wasn't stumbling into this in the way that I have. Mary Oliver, uh, that great poet, is the one to whom I attribute that inspiration. Attention is the beginning of devotion. Judge Claire, or do we open this up to questions? Yes, I think we need to start taking some questions. I just want to comment um, that my practices, and I offer this to hopefully get our uh, other participants to chime in and, and tell us what they are doing. One thing um, that I do is I have a standing order posted on my web page, which really is for education of the bar purposes as much as to meet the needs of any um, attorneys or parties who want to take advantage of the policy. But I say anyone who wants to let me know their pronouns are honorifics and I give examples including gender neutral ones and non-binary ones um, can do so in the following ways, on the record, off the record, and they will be respected. So this is a way I'm telegraphing to the bar that I am aware of the range of diverse gender identities of lawyers and parties who come before me, and I'm open to that, and I intend to be respectful. Another thing that I want to just mention is how I handle, and I know that judges who may not have even ever thought before about, you know, routinely asking in court for people's pronouns or honorifics have dealt with, is when you have a litigant, it's usually a party in my experience, who's legal name does not match the name that they use and their gender presentation, right? This comes up for me in the case of um, civil rights litigation by inmates, and it has come up in the criminal calendar context. And my staff know that my policy is that when a party tells me what their name and pronouns are, that is how we will refer to that person always, regardless of the docket, right? And I'm not gonna get hung up about the docket. <laughs> if they have not had a legal name change, the docket is what the docket is. But I make it clear, not only to my staff, but to all the lawyers in a case, that in my courtroom, this person will be referred to by the name and pronouns that they use in their daily life, regardless. That's how I handle that. And I can answer questions about it if folks want. But I really want to hear what other people have to say. And Denise is going to moderate. Well, and forgive me for taking a moment of personal privilege, but I just want to make sure we say thank you to the two of you before we go further. Um, it's been my longstanding prejudice that the magistrate judges are a phenomenal group. And you two have just reinforced that um, prejudice. I don't, I'll, I'll have to examine it. I am so grateful this program is recorded because I know for me, I want to I want to go back and listen again. I see um, some cameras uh, being turned on and I'm grateful to that. If more would like to do that, I would be grateful. I want to turn first to Diane Burt, who had a question and will just be uh, audio. Ms. Burt. Hi, everyone. I am not a judge nor an attorney. I am a court reporter. And more and more, my colleagues and I, when 
uh, creating transcripts rather than using Mr. Smith or Ms. Jones, we're starting to use Attorney Smith or Attorney Jones, thus sort of alleviating us of trying to figure out, especially if there's many parties to a case, who's who and, and who wants to be referred to as uh, Miss or Ms. or whatever their pronouns are. And I was wondering what the court and the bar think of that practice, if they think it's helpful or not, or if they have any other suggestions. I personally think it's great. That's just Judge Claire's immediate response. Mm -hmm. I think that's perfectly fine. And I have tended, you know, I, I take very seriously Judge Kasabai's caution about using neutral language that can be erasing of people's identities, but it's not always relevant. <laughs> and honestly, for purposes of a transcript identifying all the attorneys as attorney, um, rather than by Mr. or Ms. seems completely appropriate to me. Judge Kasabai, do you, what's your thought about that? Uh, I agree. I mean, I, I, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm speaking from the context of I mean, the, the obligation of the courts in creating uh, spaces that, uh, that people are, are, are included in seeing. And I, 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 don't, I, I don't immediately see that being the same uh, concern uh, when transcribing a deposition, or uh, uh, or for that matter, transcribing that which is happening in in in, the, in a courtroom on trial, I think it, certainly it. I think at that point, it's the court's responsibility to to affect the use of uh, of appropriate language, not yours in any other way than what you've already described. I I, I like the use of attorney when describing attorneys. Thank you. And there's some great, uh, helpful information in the chat. And let's turn then to, to the patient, Justin Walsh, who's had his hand up for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. And once I figure out how to lower, there we go, lower my. <laughs> uh, first off, I just wanted to thank you. This has been a great program and it's already changed um, what I'm going to do, even though I'm only sitting as a, a judge pro tem on our lower courts up in Seattle. Um, but I wanted to share one of the ways I address things. Uh, I handle uh, on the lower courts name change calendars a lot. Mm -hmm. And at the start of those calendars, um, where they often do involve a, a change in name to match gender identity, I always make sure that they know that at some point we are going to have to speak about their old name. And it's not my intention to uh, what they call dead name them uh, or, or bring up their who they no longer feel they are. And that it's not my intention to cause death by a thousand cuts there. It's not my intention to slight them. It's just to create a record. And then uh, as a follow-up to that, after we go through the colloquy and, and the name is changed, I congratulate them and state their full name. And if I don't know their gender uh, pronouns for that new name, uh, I don't use them uh, if they haven't told me. So I just congratulate them on their name change and uh, I share in their joy and try to. And I think that's important too, because it, it shows that inclusivity. So I just wanted to share what I do on one, one small piece of what I do. Thank you for your work. What a, what a happy job to have. Well, yeah, and I, I think, I, forgive me, I think uh, Justin, you might especially appreciate Judge Pratt's TED Talk. That would be my thought. <laughs> so. I, I do have it bookmarked and read, ready to watch. <laughs> So, so pretty nice to already hear that one person's uh, practices have been changed from the program. We'd love to hear from more of you if you're if you're willing. Hello, this is Michelle Gonzalez. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. sound great. Hi, sorry, I, I do not have my camera on, um, but I had a comment and and I'm curious what others are doing. I've recently I serve on a, a board, the Pollution Control Hearings Board in uh, Washington. And I recently started to drop the honorific in my written orders and only use surname unless the uh, litigant or uh, in this case, primarily witnesses might have the honorific doctor. And I do insert that in my orders. But otherwise, I have been dropping the honorific in most of my writing. Um, and I'm just wondering if others are doing that. Um, and what you all think about that, or the panelists think about that. Yeah, part of uh, yeah, my, my initial, uh, 
I use honorifics w w uh, when I know what the honorific is, when people have actually given it to me. Uh, I, in my written opinions, uh, I, I will also use they when when it is when when a, when a when an honorific or a pronoun has not been identified. So I, I, I use that language to just to make sure that uh, in the absence of being able to ask, because again, there is some concerns about asking affirmatively, I do invite people to give pronouns and for the for the attorneys to provide pronouns of their clients. So they know that when I'm incorporating those uh, that matter into my opinions, I can use that those appropriate opinions. But on, on the idea of, of using some honorifics and not others, yeah, I, I think there, there is a sense of then according a level of respect and dignity to those honorifics used and then not for others. And I, I'd maybe just, be, I, I have to think about it a little bit more, but I'd be probably mindful of either always using an honorific or not using honorifics for anyone, including doctors. So those are the questions within the chat. Oh, forgive me. I think I just cut someone off. Well, no, it was me. I was just going to uh, respond to the to the questioner because I think my practice is is similar to hers in purely written work. You know, I, I do um, follow a practice that is not identical to, but somewhat similar to Judge Kasabai's in in open court. But a lot of the work I do is just based on paper. Right. So when I'm handling a case only on papers and doing a written order, I usually refer to individuals by their first name the full time, the first time, full name the first time, and then by last name only thereafter, unless their uh, profession is pertinent, in which case officer so-and-so, doctor so-and-so, attorney so-and-so, as appropriate to the content. So that, that avoids gender questions that I am unaware of and prevents me from inadvertently misgendering someone in a context where gender isn't necessarily relevant to anything, right? I care about correctly using gender when it is pertinent, such in the cases that I mentioned where someone tells me that although they are filing a complaint from a men's prison, for example, that they are actually a transgender woman. And then I make a point of using um, the full female name and female pronouns. Thank you. And then I've twisted the wonderful arm of uh, Judge Madeline Wansley to talk a little bit about some resources that she's found helpful. Great. Thanks, Denise. Um, I did post in the chat a link to an inclusive language um, resource that was put together by the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judges. I think it's really good. It kind of um, talks about preferred phraseology and the explanations. And so, and the reason I like it too is because it's sort of in a grid format so you can find answers quickly. And um, so, so take a look at that. I would encourage everyone to take a look. I put the link right there in the, in, in the box. And this was, it, it was put together by judges, bankruptcy judges. It's shared on the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judges website. But we, and it's also got resources at the bottom of it with links to articles and other things. And I think um, we should add um, Magistrate uh, Kusubai's uh, materials to that as well, because I think that would be a great resource. But I would commend that to you because it's just a really good glossary and it was put together by our um, diversity committee. So um, hopefully people will find that helpful if you take a quick look at it. I do have a question for, for you with respect to so I, I have this habit and it's really hard to break, but I just think that politeness is important. And during my hearings, I just try to go out of my way to be respectful and to meet people and look them in the eye. But I have this habit of calling people sir and ma'am. Mm. I don't know if you have suggestions for how to break that, but when people are finished, I say, thank you, sir. I appreciate your, your position. You know, ma'am, let's turn, you know, I, I just, it, it, it's a habit. I don't know that it's a good one or a bad one, but I feel like it's maybe stale and that I should try to update my language. Do you have suggestions? I just want to acknowledge how difficult it is to break these linguistic habits. I want to openly acknowledge that I have automatically and from a place, from a good intentioned place, right, 
um, used sir and ma'am with people who I know to not be <laughs> sir or ma'am, right? Yeah. And so I have had the experience of saying, yes, ma'am, oh, I am sorry for having misgendered you, and then you just have to move on. So here's the thing no one has asked yet, but whether on the bench or off the bench, when one sticks one's foot in one's mouth and uses an incorrect pronoun or honorific or says sir or ma'am in an inappropriate context, thereby misgendering the person, the thing to do is to acknowledge your error, apologize, and then move on <laughs> without putting a whole lot of focus on it. You know, I'm sorry. That's all it takes. I'm sorry, and then use the correct name or the correct pronoun, or I'm sorry, I know you're not a ma'am, and then move on. I get caught in my own embarrassment and then fumble around in it, trying to fix it in a way that shifts the focus completely inappropriately to me um, and also just prolongs the embarrassment for the person who I've already disrespected. So the quicker I can get back into looking them in the eye and using the correct language, the better for everyone. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, that experience uh, also happened for me, to me, because of me. Uh, well, after I was already trying to incorporate more expansive language uh, in, in my in my courtroom in, in chambers, I, I was impaneling a grand jury. So we had 100 people in the room and I, I, I fell into a very, very well uh, entrenched practice of mine, uh, thanking people. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, as they introduce mm -hmm. themselves and move on to the next person. And uh, and. Uh, uh, towards the end, I, I, I started talking to somebody who, who had <clears throat> scheduling issues and we were trying to figure out whether to keep the person on the, the jury or not. And after, after I finished asking questions, I said, thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, the response was, and I'm not a sir. And, and this was in, 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 the, in, the, in court, on the record, uh, I was on the bench and it, I think, took a, a great deal of courage for somebody to do that. And, and also, the level of, of you know, and the degree to which I misgendered somebody in that space can also be incredibly, you know, harmful and 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 embarrassing, and and so I, that's, you know, the the cosmos has an interesting way of of really helping you learn the lessons that you want to learn. And given that I've I've embarked on this journey to try to create a more expansive space, I found myself being taught many lessons. And that was one of them about, well, all right, I can't take this for granted. When I've committed to using this new language, I have to do it all the time. It's not when I'm feeling up for it. It's not when I'm feeling like it won't be that much effort. And do I have to do it again this time? Because I've done it a million times before. The consistency of the practice is what makes the new norm for me stick. And for people to understand how I, how I uh, manage my courtroom. Here now with juries, I, I'll, I do refer to members of the jury, and I make it a very conscious practice, really, to say thank you for your your thank you for answering the question, and not referring to it as a gender in, in gender terms. But that that comes with practice, and also you know the recognition that when I screw up, I've got to forgive myself, and then and and make make it different the next time. All right, thank you. Thank you for your input. I appreciate that. And Denise, I don't know if I, I, I sort of pitched the inclusive language resource. And I just, I would again, invite people to take a look at it because I think it's very helpful. And thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation. I appreciate it. And I'm going to change my title right now while I'm thinking about it. <laughs> look at all this progress. And I'll say just once, as if you need my random tip, lots of times you can, um, Ask the, the other people who work in the courtroom to help you with it. I'm trying to use sir and ma'am less. Can you help me monitor it um, so that, you know, you've got another person and people like to correct you, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> they have license. <laughs> <laughs> and forgive me, I only, uh, I did twist Judge Wansley's arm, but most people, I uh, ask them if they want to unmute and I'm not sure. So I will ask this question. Um, how do you address someone over the phone? And especially if the other person becomes offended, what are some tips to diffuse the situation? And that sadly, I think is going to be our last question today, but it's it's such a good one. So let's, let's go ahead. How do you use these same practices over the phone? 
it depends, well, I suppose. Oh, go ahead, Judge Hustle. Uh, 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 you know, it, 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 I think it depends on the context. Um, you know, if, if I'm conducting a, a status conference over the phone, I, I start out at the very beginning asking people to introduce themselves. In many ways, you know, post-COVID, the, uh, the opportunity to really engage in a very intentional practice of ha having people introduce themselves is kind of a necessity because over the phone, I, I won't know who it is. On, who, I won't know who it is that's on, who, who's on the phone. And so I'll use that as, as a very convenient, comfortable cover to ask people to introduce themselves and to please provide their honorifics so I can address them appropriately, such as Mr. and Mr. Mix. I haven't had anybody push back other than that one individual who didn't want to participate. And then I had to make that assumption. So now the, the question incorporated something about somebody being offended. And maybe there, there's some more information there that I'm not sure I'm, I'm understanding about why they might be offended by, when, I'm, when speaking with them by phone. Uh, so unfortunately, the person, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, if the offense seems to be in response to a request for honorifics, then the way I would respond is simply by restating, I ask only so that I can speak to everyone respectfully and then move on as if we're all on board with respect and let the offense dissipate yeah. itself. If the offense is because I have misgendered someone, that's when it's, or may have, when I think it's important for me simply to say, I am so sorry that I misspoke and then proceed again. It's the proceeding and treating everyone on the call regardless of their identity or their pronouns with respect, that's the most important thing. What a way to end, what a way to end. I am so grateful to this fantastic faculty. I had high expectations, those expectations were exceeded. I feel like I should send Judge Bremer flowers, perhaps I should send the two of you flowers. Um, thank you, a little 1970s music, a little Audre Lorde, a little Mary Oliver. What a perfect, perfect way to spend, uh, to spend this time. Thanks to all of you, I'm, I'm genuinely grateful. Thank you, have a wonderful day. Thanks.